1 Samuel chapter number 16. Tonight we're going to look at a man named Samuel who has walked with God. He's served God faithfully. Uh, he has many, many stories at this point in his life he could tell you uh, in ways that God has done the miraculous in the lives of Israel, in his own life, and just from what he's observed. Uh, what I love about this story, which is going to sound like a negative at first, but uh, stay in tune till the end because it, it's really a positive. But, but what we find in this story is it doesn't matter how old you become, how long you've walked with God, how, how close your Christian walk is with the Lord, you can still fall into ruts in your Christian life that you need to come out of be, be, to be able uh, to move forward with God's will. And what it still shows is that God still operates the same. He uses simple instructions for his servants to be able to move forward uh, and overcome their, their own uh, ruts and their own will. With that said, I, before we read, I, I just want to let you know, I'm not trying to be hard on Samuel tonight. I think if, if many of us looked at Samuel's life, uh, we could quickly identify, if I go to the grave with half of the accomplishments that Samuel has, that's a life well lived. And so my intention tonight is not to be hard on Samuel, rather is to be encouraging. I, I think uh, most of us here this evening are probably dear saints of God who have a desire uh, to walk with God. Uh, a desire to serve God and probably beyond these walls do, do, does or do have a walk with God in our private life. And so uh, this message is to be an encouragement. Um, okay, so uh, this is a rule. It, it's, uh, it's not a pastor rule. It's, it's just a, a Northway rule that if you're up here preaching, you get to command the, the listeners that when I stop reading, you have to stop reading too. Right? That that's not a that's not a Pastor Vaught rule. Uh, that's you know. But as we do read this tonight, I I would ask that it, when I stop reading, if you would stop reading as well, and that way uh, you won't get ahead because we're only going to look at a few verses tonight. And so if if you get ahead of the reading, uh, you're going to be all distracted, and you'll be like, "That's not what happened," and and just just you just have to wait. Okay. So chapter number sixteen, verse number one. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go, I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. Stop reading right there, all eyes up here. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on the message. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us to your house tonight. Lord, I believe you have a good truth here for us to, to grab hold of. And I, I don't want to get in the way of that. And uh, I pray that you would give me clarity of thought and speech. And uh, would you just bless the hour. Help me to be a blessing. Would you fill me with your spirit and bless the hour. In your name I pray. Amen. So verse 1 opens up, God comes to Samuel. He's revealing his plan uh, for Samuel uh, to carry out. He has chosen Samuel, God's man. Samuel's a prophet. He, he has been used by God uh, to convey messages from God to his people, Israel. And Samuel's in a place right now, the first place we see him is discouragement. Uh, God asks Samuel, how long will thou mourn for Saul now, now, Samuel had good reason to be discouraged with Saul. Uh, if, if you think back um, in, in the previous chapter, chapter number 15, Saul was uh, commanded by God to go against the Amalekites. The reason why that's important is because the Amalekites were the first nation that after Israel left Egypt, the first nation to come up against war with Israel. And, and God had promised the children of Israel, there will be a day that I wipe off the Amalekites from the face of the earth. They will be utterly destroyed, and that's his promise to the children of Israel. And Saul got the amazing opportunity to carry out God's will and God's promise for Israel, destroy the Amalekites. If you're familiar with the story, you know that God told Saul, wipe them all off the earth. That's, that's the men, that's the women, that's the children, and that's the animals. Don't save anyone alive. Don't take anything. Saul does not do that. Uh, the, the, the Amalekites were enemies of God, and yet Saul thought it was his job to, to save what he deemed was best. And so he saved the king Agag alive. He saved the best of what he thought was uh, the animals. And, and Saul, um, Samuel shows up and, and asks him, did you carry all what the Lord told you to carry out? 
and, and, he, and, and he confronts Saul with this. And, and the bottom line is Saul disobeyed God. And God, God has said, okay, there is a series of events that you have violated my principles and my commands. I've rejected you as king. That's what he tells Saul. And so Saul disobeyed God. He did what he wanted to do. And again, going back to chapter number 16, we see Samuel in this place of discouragement. And I, and I just think if we, if we go back, and, and I could tell you more about Saul, how he started off as a good king. God didn't choose uh, a, a, a less than acceptable man to lead Israel when they wanted a king. Uh, I guess just for the, the sake of going back so you have all the context, when Israel wanted a king, I believe back in chapter number 13, uh, God was supposed to be their king. God, God was the one leading them, but they said, we want to be like all the other nations. We want a king to rule over us, to lead us into battle. And, and God laid out all of the details. This is what's going to take place if I bring you a king. And they still said, yeah, we, Lord, we want a king. And so, so God gives them a king. But what's amazing is that when you examine the life of Saul in the beginning, that's a life to model ourselves after. He was, he was actually a humble individual in the beginning. He had good character traits about him in the beginning. He was not full of pride in the beginning. And, and he lost all those things. And so coming back and seeing where Samuel is at, Samuel, I believe, was a big supporter of Saul early on. I think he wanted to see Saul succeed. I think he wanted to see God's will carried out and, uh, and, and, and Saul to be a, a support to God's people. And, and but then when, when Saul disobeys God in a terrible way, he loses his testimony and he fails the expectations that were placed on him by God and by man. Have you ever known someone that maybe uh, you had a relationship with at church or at work and maybe this individual happened to have a walk with God at one point in their life and uh, you can identify times where they, they were spiritual warriors or, or heroes of the faith in your mind. They were a, a leader to you. Uh, and and may, maybe, maybe not even someone spiritual. Let's, let's go as far as even saying maybe you knew someone who was just a, a, from an earthly standpoint a morally good person. And they've been a help to you, and, and, and you've seen them grow, and, uh, and then all of a sudden, one day, you hear some news that they've done some things that they shouldn't do. Uh, I can remember growing up uh, where there were pastors uh, on, on other occasions that fell into sin, and uh, people I knew in my church growing up who had uh, given in and fallen into sin, and, and can I just tell you, and if you can relate, that's discouraging, it's discouraging when you see someone who was once on fire for the things of God and loved God and, and obeyed God and, and was leading others to follow God and they, they fall in or for whatever reason they give in to sin and, and now they're no longer in the position that they were. They're not qualified to lead God's people in the same way and ultimately God says the, the dynamic has changed. Can I just get a witness? That can be discouraging when you see that happen. And so, so if you know what that's like, you know how the emotions uh, that circulate around you and you wonder how could this happen and, and it's overwhelming and, and you think of the consequences that this person has to go through that if, if you could just rewind time and, and convince them not to, you would do that and uh, it, it's just heartbreaking and this is where we find Samuel in this chapter. God says, how long will thou mourn for, Sam, for Saul seeing I've rejected him? And it's just easy to see we can understand why Samuel would be discouraged. Now, God did not directly rebuke Samuel for mourning over Saul. But he does mention, you know, Samuel, it's time to move on. It, it, there's no more productivity to come from this position anymore. I have a will for you to carry out, and I want you to move on. And, and, and it's easy to get stuck here. I've seen, I've seen Christians that get stuck in these ruts in life, and there's many we could mention. We're going to try to just stick to our text tonight. But this rut of discouragement can be a big hindrance in a Christian's life. Even people who have served God faithfully for a long time and haven't done anything wrong per se, but get discouraged by the way other people have uh, and the choices they've made and, and get discouraged by the things not going the way they feel like they, they should go or the way that they feel like God wants them to go. And it, and it can get discouraging, and if we're not careful, we can start living or even dwelling on the things that have happened in the past. And that, my friend, prohibits us 
in a great way from moving forward for the things of God. God wants us to be in the present and thinking about the future. In Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19, it says, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. And that's God's talking to his people, saying, I don't want you to dwell on the things that have happened. I don't want you to dwell on the past. I want you to think about the things that I'm going to do in the future. So moving along, God tells Samuel, Fill thine horn with oil in verse 2. And, uh, you know, we see another issue standing in the way of God's will here. Look at verse number 2 one time. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take an heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. Samuel says, how can I go? Saul hears this, he's going to take my life. And, And from a humanistic standpoint, I think we can identify with this as well. Saul's in a position of power. He has the military on his side. He has uh, certainly aides and people uh, who assist him. He, he has people who are going to be uh, able to give him information on what's going on in, in the, the nation. And uh, it, it's very easy to, to identify how Samuel would be, would be scared for his life, would have some fear or some worry uh, carrying out what God is asking him to carry out. You know, uh, Saul... Uh, if, he, if he wanted to, could, and if he found out about this, could easily uh, hunt Samuel down, uh, you know, have him killed or commit harm against him. And so again, from a humanistic kind of mindset, it's easy to see. Yeah, I, I would probably be scared too with this idea that I'm going to go out from hiding now. I mean, uh, after, after all, uh, Samuel was the one who delivered the message to Saul saying, God's rejected you as being a king. God's going to refuse you. He's going to raise up a new king. And so uh, the, the king of Israel has already been confronted this way. And now God's asking Samuel, I want you to go out from here and go anoint a new king. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a big task. We're, we're so prone, even in our own lives, to this area as well. This rut, if you will, in our Christian life. Even more so when we're already discouraged. We so easily get wrapped up in what we can accomplish in our own strength and, 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 and what we can uh, think of in our own mindset of the, the things that, that are against us, uh, we, what we can accomplish, forgetting the moments of victory that we've already previously had from, God, from God's hand in our life. You know, Samuel's a man of God. He, he's, he's seen God do miraculous things. Uh, you think about Samuel was a miracle baby himself. Do you remember Hannah? Hannah had prayed, Lord, please, I, I want a child. I'll dedicate him to you. And God fulfills that promise. He fulfills that request. And he brings Samuel up in the temple. I mean, there's not too many individuals that get to experience the manifestation of God's voice in their life the way Samuel has experienced God's voice in his life. I mean, you think about that, being able to communicate with God on that deep of a level. That's something special. And so Samuel's walked with God. He's seen this from the time he was, he was young, but still in this moment, we see him in his older years worrying about his life and doing what God's asked him to do. Thinking about what, how how things can be accomplished with human strength. How many of us can relate to this? You know, you, maybe there's areas of your life where you can uh, identify God has come through for you. Uh, when Michaela and I were starting out, I was still uh, full-time working, uh, still a full-time student, trying my, my very hardest to not rack up student loan debt. And so I was taking as much as I could uh, and, and sending that to the college bill. Uh, we had just bought our new uh, condo at the time. Uh, financial means were extremely tight. And if I was just looking at the amount of money coming in versus the amount of money going out, it's like, this is just not going to work. And I can remember having to pray, Lord, I, I don't know how this is all going to work. And we're, we're not going to not give to church. We still tithe during all of that. And, and it's just amazing how God always provided through that. It's amazing how the things I still worry about sometimes, and the moment I ask the Lord for it, how quickly he brings provision for our family. And I, and I can identify with that and in, in how I watched my parents go through uh, difficulties and struggles and how they asked the Lord to come through and we would pray as a family and God would show up and he would do these amazing things in our family. But I still struggle sometimes, worrying about how are things all going to work out, even though God's come through so many times. Can someone in here identify with that? 
Where it's like, you know, I, I've seen God do amazing things in my life. And I've been in church. But still sometimes I, I do worry sometimes. Maybe God's provided for you in times uh, where you had no idea how you were going to cover everything yourself. Isn't it strange how we can experience monumental moments of victory in our spiritual life where God shows up, but not so long after we're in another situation and we think, oh Lord, I'm going to be a mess if you don't show up. And we start worrying about what, I can't cover all this myself. And, and the Lord said, you're not intended to, to cover your life yourself. Now, we're only looking at two of these, uh, you know, I've kind of labeled them ruts in our spiritual Christian walk. But there are other ruts. I'm just going to mention them, uh, a couple. Uh, there are many we could look at. I, I think bitterness is a big rut that, that Christians fall into. It prohibits them from moving forward. Resentment and, and anger, those are certainly ruts in the Christian walk that, that we can uh, fall susceptible to based on circumstances that happen around us that we weren't even part of initially. But if we're not careful, we can fall into these things. Again, they're not mentioned in this text, so we're going to try to stick to what, what is here. Here's the problem with, with ruts. The ruts we can face in Christian life, whether, whether it's you know, any of those ones I just mentioned or these two in our passage, discouragement, fear, and worry, is ruts tend to lead us to a place where we can't move forward for God until we get through the rut. Ruts tend to lead us to a place of self-will conflicting with the will of what God wants us to do instead of following him. Now, we've already identified why uh, Samuel might feel this way, and, and that doesn't mean that we justify it. Uh, again, not to be hard on Samuel, uh, an amazing saint uh, and, and, and someone we can glean from, absolutely. But he, right now, if, if we're just to, to look at, you know, if, if Samuel doesn't overcome these areas, he will not be able to fulfill God's will. Okay, uh, so what, what's so important in all of this, is that God's will has not changed. God still desires for a new king to be anointed. And he still desires to have Samuel do it. It's amazing that, that God's will hasn't changed. Even after coming to Samuel and Samuel saying, Lord, uh, you know, I mean, there, there, maybe there's more in the, the, the conversation between the lines of, Lord, I'm discouraged. Uh, this is difficult for me, uh, Lord. And, and, he, and we know that he says, Lord, I can't, I can't move forward because Saul, if he hears about it, he's going to kill me. Which, by the way, if we're just being honest, when, whenever we talk to God like that, Lord, I can't do this and here's why. What we're saying is, Lord, there's a, there's a problem with your plan. In other words, we're saying, Lord, this is not a great plan. I, I, I am not comfortable with your plan, God. I have, I have my, my comforts to think about. But God still desires these things. So, so just so we're all, we're all here, right? There, there is what God wills and what God wants to accomplish through Samuel. And there is, there is what man wills and what man wants conflicting with the will of God. There are, there are stories in the Bible we could look at where this would seem like much more dramatic. But again, I, I think that, that there are times even in our Christian walk here where, where if we're not careful, we'll think, well, it's not that big a deal. Like, I mean, Samuel's already been used by God. And maybe there's areas where you can identify in your life. God's used me in some ways. I've been used by God. I, I feel like, you know, the Lord, I, I'm not here fighting the Lord. But there's still sometimes these little areas of our life where God says, I want you to do this. And he, does, he is not met with, absolutely, I'll do it. He's met with a conflict of wills. How many of you have kids and, and, and you have things that you are wanting your children to do around the house? Clean their room. Wash the dishes. Uh, Helene is still not able to wash the dishes. Uh, I even put her up on a step stool the other day, and it's, no, nah, we're, not, we're not trying. I am trying to get her to, to feed the cats by herself. That's one I'm, I'm, like, really working on, and I think we're getting closer. Um, but, but how many of you have ever given your child something to do and were met with anything other than, absolutely, I'll do that. That sounds like a great idea. Mom, Dad, like, thanks for telling me to clean my room. I'll get right to it. No, oftentimes there's, even if there's obedience, sometimes there's a sigh. 
That's, that's, that's a child saying, I, I, I'd rather do something else. I don't really like this plan. Uh, but then sometimes there are, no, you're going to do this, and there's the, you're met with, no, I really don't want to do that. Not too long ago, uh, I mean, you know, Helene's only a little bit older than two, uh, but that's as old as it takes to have a strong will. That's as old as it takes to have a will to say, I'm not going to listen to you. And, and I told her to clean up these, these uh, blocks, and she just stood there. And it wasn't the kind of uh, stand there that I don't understand. It was, I'm not going to do that, Dad. And, and so for the next 30 minutes, through biblical parenting as best I can, she became motivated to clean up these blocks. The, the, the idea here as a parent is I'm the one in charge. My will will, will be carried out. And, and, and at least for me, I don't have anyone else around the house to carry out my will yet. I mean, you know, we, we only have Helene. So I, I can't say, you know, I'll just get somebody else to do it, you know. Yeah, that was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> you know, I need another helper around the house maybe. I, God could have easily done that, though. God can easily do that if he wanted to say, you know what, I've got plenty of people that are willing to follow what I want to do. You know, every time that we tell God, Lord, I, I can't do that, here's why. God could say, if he wanted to, that's fine. I'll choose somebody else to fulfill my will and somebody else that will be involved in carrying out God's plan. He could have easily said, Samuel, I'm God. You're going to do absolutely what I tell, tell you to. And he would have been justified in saying that. But what's so amazing and so encouraging about the God that we serve is God does not do that. God, God actually tells Samuel, hey, I'm going to protect you. I know that you're uncomfortable. I know that this is difficult. But actually, I still want to use you even though you're worried about these things right now. And you shouldn't be worried because I've already proven myself for your entire life but I still want to use you in a great way. God tells Samuel in a patient way, I'm going to protect you. Look, look at verse, uh, the end of verse number two. One more time, the Lord said, take an heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord and call Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show thee what thou shalt do and thou shalt anoint me him whom I name unto thee. So God tells Samuel, you know, I'm going to protect you. I, I, I want you to go anyway, and, and don't read ahead yet, okay? We'll, we'll get to verse number four, but don't read ahead. Um, here's where we start to see the, the, that Samuel is faced with an a immediate decision now. God has doubled down on what his will is. God initially came to Samuel and said, I want you to do this, and, and he let Samuel talk. But now he has said again, no, I want you to go. And so Samuel has to decide the same thing that every person comes to a decision in life with. If you're going to follow God or if you're going to, say, double down on what you think is best and double down on your will. It's interesting that in the previous chapter, Saul was faced with the exact same thing. Here's the will of God. You kill and destroy the Amalekites. And Saul did what Saul wanted to do. But now Samuel is faced with this same dilemma. Follow God and his will or conflict with God, with my will. It's amazing. Uh, you know, God could have taken the opportunity uh, to lay out the master plan. You know, often we, we think that in our Christian walk, we, we, we get in these ruts and maybe God says move and we think, okay, Lord, just, just tell me how it's all going to work out. What, what is the whole plan, the end plan? But what's, what we already read in verse number three was God said, no, you go to Jesse's house and then I'll tell you what I'm going to do next. God says one step at a time. God gives simple instructions all throughout scripture for those that are willing to follow him. It's not a complicated journey. It's a one step at a time kind of journey. And Samuel's faced with a choice. Friends, we're all going to be met with these same things. Many of us, if, if, you're, if you're breathing in this room, you've already had dilemmas in your life. Whether I'm going to do what God says or I'm going to do what I want to do or what I think is best. I'm so thankful we serve a God who, who is not uh, a God to just smash us every time we say, Lord, I can't do that. He's just a patient God with us, so, so patient with us. Simple, simple obedience. Look at verse number four. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake and came to Bethlehem. 
And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, come now peaceably. Samuel obeys God. This is the defining marks of a faithful servant to God. Someone who is willing to obey God's simple instructions. So I just want to draw some, some application from this and, and then we'll go home. Don't get stuck in a rut in your Christian life. Maybe there's something that you can identify uh, that you have a tendency to get stuck on. Maybe there's something that you've been dealing with for a long time. I just want to encourage you. God has a desire to use every person in this room in a unique way, in a special way. God has a will for your life. And you can't possibly think that you're going to be as an effective uh, Christian servant when you're saying, Lord, I just can't take the next step. The Lord needs you to take the next step. You have to overcome that. Uh, no matter, uh, and again, no matter how long we serve God, we can, we're susceptible to our own will and our own ways and, and getting stuck in these ruts. Uh, Moses, I think, of, I think of these men of God in the Bible who, who were able to accomplish great things for God but they all, at some point, we can probably identify in their lives, they got hung up on some things. They got stuck on some things. Moses experienced worry at times, and uh, Elijah experienced that. And, and we see this in Samuel's life. And, and it's unfortunate to hear, you know, it's like, well, you know, Brother Jonathan, I came to church to be encouraged. Uh, you said this was encouraging. Now you're telling me I'm going to get stuck in a rut. It should be encouraging to know that it shouldn't be a surprise when it happens shouldn't be a surprise when it happens because God's will, that hasn't changed. God still has a will and, it, and he wants to use you. And so uh, in, our, in our text, you know, we, we have this tendency uh, to, to, you know, get discouraged. We also have the, the tendency to become fearful. Uh, you know, unfortunately, at times we, we have this innate uh, desire in our DNA. It's ground within us to protect ourselves. Uh, I, I think of the, the folks that, that uh, were affected great in great ways with COVID. I still know people to this day who are scared to death of COVID. I mean, they're, they're, they're scared of it. And, and what that shows me is if I place my security or my, my health at a higher level than it should be on the hierarchy of importance, when God comes and tells me, I want you to accomplish this for me, I want you to take this step of faith and do this. If I've placed anything before that, I'm going to struggle. And so maybe what would be helpful tonight is if you already know what you, you have a tendency to struggle with, maybe you ask God, Lord, help me, help me with that. And maybe identify areas in the past where you have done what you want to do or what you think is better instead of what God's asked you to do so that next time God shows up with some simple instructions, you're able to overcome your ruts. You're able to move forward for God. Uh, you know, living uh, for God at any age uh, and, and being used by him is going to take faith. It was uh, Pastor Burton Gates who stood behind this pulpit uh, a few years ago and said, uh, the, the Christian journey and the Christian walk is not for the faint of heart. It's, it's not. And, and you take a man who is in the, the, uh, the ghetto of Philly, you would, you would probably feel nervous going to church there every week uh, and, and walking by the, uh, the drug paraphernalia on the sidewalks uh, on the way up to the church steps. I, I mean, it, it is that dark in that area. But here's a man that can stand there with confidence in God and has faith and says, we're going to be just fine. I'm doing exactly what God's called me to do. That's encouraging. So certainly there are more ruts, uh, you know, but we're all going to make a choice in life. We have the choice to embrace uh, our comforts, uh, our, our own will, uh, or to trust in God's simple instructions. Uh, I just, I will, we'll kind of close with this, simple instructions. Have you ever seen a story in the Bible where someone had to go back to the Lord and say, Lord, could you just simplify what you asked me to do? I'm, 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 I'm too overtaken with how complex this, this order is that you've given me. I don't find that anywhere. In my own life, I can't think of any times where I've thought, Lord, uh, this thing you asked me to do is too complicated. Can you, can you simplify that for me? God seems to always operate off of simple instructions. Simple instructions. Simple obedience. You know, there, there are some, and, and this happens in the life of a young person often where they say, I just want to know God's will for my life. And I think oftentimes, you know, I, and I struggle with that as a, a young person too, you know, like there's this big master plan will for my life. I have to figure out, I have to know, uh, but you don't. 
You don't have to know God's master plan for your life. If you'll just follow God's simple instructions, follow the simple things he's already given us to do. Uh, you know, going to church is a pretty simple instruction. Uh, that, that, but if you embrace the world's reasoning for that, there will be times, and, and there's Christians that can already come up with many excuses why church just doesn't fit into their life. And, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident most people here don't struggle with that. You're here on Thursday night. Uh, but, but just for uh, you know, examples of, of the simple things that, that God's given and laid out in Scripture about tithing. So simple. It's so simple. Trust God with your finances. But if we're not careful and we embrace the wrong mindset and we, we come up with these, these things of like, well, my, my financial plan really doesn't fit that in. And, and, and we can come up with these reasons why we can't obey a simple instruction. Uh, but the truth is that God's instructions are always simple. And that means that they're always simple to obey. And, and uh, you know, raising children the right way, taking certain jobs, spending Money, you know, the book of Proverbs is so filled with ways on how you can be a, a good manager of your finances. It's amazing. But there's so many people out there who will embrace these ways of, of spending and saving and approach it from what they think works. And, and, and you'll never do better than God's simple instructions. I love the acronym uh, many of you have maybe heard for Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. It's so true. You know, God lays out these simple instructions in every area of our lives. The real problem is we, we tend to struggle with what's in the handbook. We tend to struggle and, and we'll make it complicated to fit our life or, or, or go lean back on our comforts or lean back on, on, on what we think will happen. Uh, but ultimately, God is looking for us to follow him in the simple things. The simple things. It's amazing how, how such a complex God can lead his people with such simple instructions. So what will help you make the right choice, uh, at least what, what I think would help me make the right choice, is when the next time God gives me something to follow, just look back on whose track record is better. My track record stinks, okay? If I look back on all the times I said, Lord... I'm going to try to do it this way. It doesn't work out as well. God always, always has a plan. He has a perfect track record. He's proven it time after time. Examine the things that you value in life. Because what we value t tends to be what we fall back on when things get uncomfortable. I didn't say God's in simple instructions were not going to be uncomfortable. Oftentimes, God's simple instructions, as we've already seen from our text... They're extremely uncomfortable. They're extremely, uh, they, they make no sense to us at times. Sometimes, sure, they're easy and we can, we can say, oh, oh, that's an easy instruction. Yeah, I can do that. Go to church. I, I don't have a problem with that. At this point in my life, I don't have a problem with that. But that doesn't mean that when I'm at church and God lays out something else, another area of my life I need to follow, that I don't go, okay, that's a little bit hard. It, 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 God, God's always going to push us to be uncomfortable, to get us to move sometimes. Sometimes that's what God's will takes us through. So if you overvalue things like safety, you'll have a, you'll have a tendency to, to struggle with that when, when next time God, God brings something simple. Uh, and, and, and whatever the area that, that maybe the Lord's speaking to you on, uh, maybe I try to identify that. The last notable mention I want to say here is that God's way is always, always perfect. Look at the success of Israel under the leadership of David, who God was sending Samuel to anoint. Uh, I mean, pretty amazing success. And, and all the stories and the, and the Psalms and the, the, the things we have written in the Bible that happened as a result of David's life and, and uh, ultimate David's dependence on God. Uh, you know, we, God's not going to lay all that out for us just like, just like we don't lay it all out for our children, do we? We don't, we don't lay it all out for them. So, I mean, sometimes maybe we do, but God doesn't have to do that. And God's not required to lay out his master plan. And honestly, it makes it pretty exciting when, when we'll just follow one step at a time and God leads us through some amazing things that if he were to show us everything he had planned for our life, we'd probably, a lot of us, have, have a hard time uh, even moving forward with one more step. So we get to choose obedience and faith or dependence. 
and say, I'm in control. You get to choose between Samuel 15, defeat what Saul chose, the end of the road because he did what he wanted to do, or the victory that Samuel kept moving forward with simple instructions. Looks like God's plan worked out for Samuel just fine. Samuel never became injured by Saul. Samuel uh, ended his days serving God faithfully, and he was able to overcome discouragement, fear, and worry by just saying yes to God. And so the encouragement tonight for the saint of God is live a life where you are willing to say yes to whatever God says. That is where you will be the safest, the most secure, the most successful. Your life has the opportunity to be blessed unfathomably when you just say, yes, Lord, I'll do the next simple instruction.